course, there's a famous song written about the 12 days of Christmas with the uh, two turtle doves and the three French hen and six geese laying and so on. Uh, if you really think about that song, uh, and, and you were the, I, and I assume that it is speaking of the girlfriend of this fellow who's going to bring all these gifts, but uh, if you can imagine, you know, the first day two turtle doves, and second day three French hens, and, and six geese of land, and seven swans swimming, eight whatever, lords of leaping, and so on. Uh, I mean, this poor woman's house is filled with fine birds and all kinds of things on. But just imagine what that would be like to have been a recipient of all of those gifts on those 12 days. Well, in any event, uh, let's see what Scripture has to say about some of the things that were going on in that period. Uh, and I'll read to you from Gospel of St. Matthew, where we have one of the two accounts of the birth of Christ. Um, in it, we have discovered that these strange people called the wise men have come, and they have asked the king, King Herod, where Jesus was born. He asks men who study Jewish scripture, and they said, well, we think that it points to the little town of Bethlehem. And so Herod tells the wise men to go and find out exactly where the baby is, and he would wish to come and worship the baby as well. So come back and tell him about it. And so we read that they went back another way, and we talked about that last Sunday, uh, by another route. And so the story takes up there, and here's what we read. When they had gone, namely the wise men, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, that is Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, quote, out of Egypt I have called my son, unquote. When Herod realized that he had been tricked, outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Quote again, a voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. That ends the reading of that story. That's a tough story. Always found it hard to read that story. As I said in my prayer this morning, I'm, I'm puzzled because we think of God as all knowing, all powerful, all loving. And he wants Joseph to be sure that the baby Jesus is taken away from the murderous clutches of heaven. But could not God have also warned the parents of the other children, of the other baby boys, so that they might have gotten out of the reach of, of uh, Herod's murderous intent? There's also a story about the grandson of Herod, if you read it in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, 
there is a story there about how he had put to death one of the apostles of Jesus, namely James the Apostle. And as a result of his having done this, and as the scripture text says, because he refused to give glory to God, uh, then God took the life of Herod. Could he not have taken the life of uh, this Herod uh, as well, so that he could not have perpetrated this awful evil on all of those people? These are puzzling questions. I certainly don't know the answers to them. And when we come to a text like this, I have to ask, well, is there another way of looking at this text so that there is meaning for us and that there is something really solid that we can take with us in our daily lives here and now? And so I call this escapes to Egypt. Escapes to Egypt. By which I mean a retreat from what the immediate future holds so that we can serve at a later time. A retreat from what the immediate future holds in order that we might serve at a later time. If you read the Gospel of Matthew very carefully, you will note that he is the most Jewish of the four writers of the Gospels. His mission seems to be to try to convince his fellow Jews that Jesus is the promised one. That Jesus is the Messiah, spoken about repeatedly in the texts of the Old Testament, particularly the prophet writings in the Old Testament. Again and again, you find Matthew saying, as the scripture says, and of course the only scripture that Matthew had was the Old Testament, because the New Testament had not even been put together for several hundred years after Christ was born. And so the scripture that he's talking about is the Old Testament scripture. Repeatedly he cites passage after passage to try to convince his fellow Jews that this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem of Judea is the promised one, is the Messiah. So he tells us that uh, in the story of the wise men, that the Old Testament said that Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. The Old Testament says that Herod would kill the children. So again and again he cites all of these things. One of the stories that Matthew must have known very well was a story about a little baby long centuries ago named Moses. When the king in that day would call the Pharaoh of Egypt, and determined that all of the male Hebrew children were to be put to death. And the mother of Moses placed the baby in a little uh, constructed boat that she had made and put him in the Nile River where the current would take him to a place where the daughter of Pharaoh uh, took her morning bath. And Moses, as you know the story, was saved so that at a later time in Moses' life, when Moses became an adult, he could take upon himself the leadership of the Hebrew people and deliver them from their slavery in Egypt. And what Matthew is attempting to show in our story is that just as Moses was delivered when he was a child from the River Nile to later become an adult leader in the deliverer of his people, so Jesus would be rescued from another king at another time, so that when he became an adult, he would be able to lead not only the Jews, but all humanity out of the bondage of evil and the clutches of all those desires that bring us down in this life. And so that's the, the kind of parallel that Matthew is trying to bring to us in the story of uh, Jesus being taken to Egypt. I looked at a map and tried to calculate how far this would be for Mary and Joseph. This was a bad time. You, you and I think that Christmas was a very happy time with open presents, family comes, and we eat and drink. And Everything is merry, but 
for Mary in the first century, things were not like Mary. How difficult was the birth? How about diapers for the child? How in the world did this new mother get on in that barn? And if all those things weren't bad enough in those early days after the birth, then comes the news, Joseph, Mary, you've got to get out of here. If you don't, the baby's life uh, will be taken. And now they've got to get ready and walk 262 miles from where they are in Israel to where they will be in Egypt. I remember playing and taking off from the airport in Holland and I was on my way to Cairo, Egypt, the land at the airport there. And I remember the plane crossing the Mediterranean Sea, going south from Europe, from the, the, the Netherlands to North Africa. And when the plane came to North Africa, saw that coast of North Africa, the plane then turned eastward and headed toward uh, Cairo, Egypt. Fast tracks of sand, nothing. This is mile after mile looking out of the world. It was sand. And then finally, begin to see a very narrow green strip. No wonder the historians and the geographers have referred to Egypt as the gift of the Nile. The gift of the Nile. Because there is nothing in the others than the water and uh, just narrow strips of green on either side of the water, and then on the, either side of the green, uh, just stretch after stretch of barren land. And Joseph and Mary, on foot, maybe with their donkey, maybe the donkey for Mary, uh, and, and making their way 260 two odd miles uh, to Egypt. Where they will stay for, we don't know exactly how long. Hardship after hardship after hardship. But Jesus was not ready to enter his mission, obviously. He's a baby. Not ready to face the errors of the world. As Moses was not ready to face the Pharaohs of the world. So there's a time in our lives when we run up against things that we may need to step back. We may need to withdraw for a time so that we can prepare to meet life in a more uh, significant and meaningful way. The time will come to stand and be counted. But God's intention is that we escape to Egypt to do a little waiting. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes reminds us that there is a time for everything. Tells us there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, and he might have added a time to get psyched up and a time to chill out. Because life needs that kind of thing. We need to ease on down to Egypt until the winds and rains have subsided and the smoke has cleared. But God will not let us remain in Egypt or floating on the river. God called me to come to Bethlehem Christian Church in South Africa. I have retired at least two or three times. <laughs> and the voice of God came through the mouth of Jim Evans. Uh, Jim kept saying, uh, you're the one to do this. Well, 
series on the history of Christianity. What does the Lord have for you? I mean, as you kind of spend your time in this Egypt before the, the big day, you're going to be meeting next month an, an extremely important meeting. This is your planning meeting. <coughs> you should start thinking about these things right now while you're in Egypt, as it were. And, and not just wait until you sit down on that Sunday afternoon. These planning sessions are probably going to be the most vital planning sessions that you and other Christian church have had in maybe many a year. And so how important it is for you to spend this time in your Egypt getting ready to stand and be counted. Start thinking about how you can help and support the new minister when she comes. Start thinking about how you may tell her she can help and support you so that you can do the work of, of ministry here at Bethany Christian Church Center. This is Egypt time for members of Bethany Christian Church. Whatever else the strange story tells us, I'm offering you one way to think of it as a kind of allegory for your and my lives getting away, getting out of town, avoiding the battles until we are prepared 